use the debate bell. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Tracy Dixon. I'm one of the deputy directors here at Menzies and I'll be one of your hosts this evening. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the country. The University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the Mahunana people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which this campus was built. So welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here and to help host this evening. I had two sets of notes prepared. One, if Bernie makes it. The other, if Bernie doesn't make it. Because our helper tonight, Bernie Hobbs, was coming out of Sydney. And as some of you may have heard, Sydney was shut down to just one runway. She is here. So the great thing is I get to be myself because I'm good, but I'm not sure I'm that good. I've been practicing some one-liners, but now it is just my pleasure to welcome you to Menzies as part of tonight's debate. So I get to tell you a little bit of housekeeping. The first thing is, if you can't hear, please wave your hand because we really want everyone to be able to hear the tonight's debate. The other thing to mention is that we have fire ex exits down here where you can see the green signs and otherwise at the top of the stairs. But if we happen to have a fire, there's plenty of students and Menzies people around who can help us. So look for them. The other thing to mention is that we have bathrooms in this building. If you need them, they're along the orange corridor, which is outside. So that's it for housekeeping. So welcome. Many of you here are probably familiar faces, familiar audience members here at Menzies, and we welcome you back. For those of you who haven't been here before, we welcome you for the first time, and we hope you enjoy um, tonight's debate. So for those of you who don't know about Menzies, we've been around for almost 30 years and from small beginnings, we now have a staff of almost 300 staff and postgraduate research students, including around 40 staff and students in our cardiometabolic health and diseases research theme. And there are several more who are interested in these diseases who sit in our epidemiology um, area of research investigating cardiovascular disease. So our mission here at Menzies is pretty straightforward. We're here to perform internationally significant medical research that will lead to healthier, longer and better lives for all Tasmanians. So rather, rather than explain this in a little bit more detail myself, what I'd like to play for you now is a short video that really, I guess, encapsulates and explains our mission. So I'm going to dim the lights. I'm not sure how romantic it will be. <laughs> and we'll play this video. If you or a loved one or someone close to you has had their life affected by multiple sclerosis, could you please stand? has been affected by dementia. Could you please stand? If arthritis has affected you, someone in your family, or someone you know, could you please stand? If heart disease has affected your life, or the life of someone you love, could you please stand? Could anyone whose life or the life of a loved one, or the life of a friend who has been affected by cancer. Please stand. I think that video really does encapsulate what, what we're all about and it is trying to make a difference for Tasmanians who are affected by um, many of these different diseases. So tonight we're here to talk about heart disease. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a neuroscientist. I love the brain. If 
but I'm here to tell you about the heart and I can feel Tom kind of like, <laughs> oh, what does she know? What does she know about the heart? It's kind of about pumps and valves. <laughs> you know, it's the brain, so special, so beautiful. No. <laughs> anyway, but the heart, it's a special pump. It's a special set of valves. And we know that if we have fatty plaque deposits occurring in those um, special um, arteries supplying blood to the heart, that it's the major cause of heart disease. And we know that when things go wrong in this system, not only can things cause just disease, but of course we can have major heart attacks and we can have deaths. So this is an important part of the research that we're doing here at Menzies. It really is an important part of our mission. So today I'd like to introduce Bernie Hobbs. She's going to moderate the rest of the debate. I'll tell you a little bit about Bernie. She was once a science teacher and tested the waters of her career as a medical researcher working on the dengue vaccine. However, since 1997, she's been talking and writing about science. She's been regularly spruiking science on the ABC in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, and she also hosts science events around the country. She's having way too much fun with Dr Alice Williamson on their new ABC podcast called Dear Science. So thanks, Bernie, for being here. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> And I'll hand over the reins to you for the rest of the debate. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Tracy, and thanks, everyone, for their warm welcome. And thanks, Virgin, for coming good at the last minute after cancelling one flight, delaying the next one, boarding us on one, and then, oh, there was a problem with that. We had to get off that one and get on another one, and I literally just got here. If I look a kind of weird colour, that's because I hastily applied some makeup in the back of a cab <laughs> 10 minutes ago. So um, when I saw myself in the bathroom, I quickly grabbed a towel and wiped the outer layer off, but I can still tell there's too much. Um, Tom, in Am I right? In say, did Tracy just say the special artery that supplies blood to the heart? She did say that. Yeah. yeah. The brain. Stick with the brain, Trace. <laughs> the arteries go away. A for away. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> that said, um, I'm no medical researcher. Uh, if you're curious about the progress of the dengue vaccine, it only got better since I left. Uh, um, but it's an absolute delight to be back here. I think this is the fourth um, Menzies debate I've been involved in, and every one of them, without fail, has been engaging, informative and entertaining, not least of all because of the various interpretations of the topic taken by members within and across different teams on the same nights. Um, also, the, the topics have have never really related to me personally with um, multiple sclerosis and, um, and stem cells and the ever-loving prostate cancer. Uh, but this time, it's a different story. Um, heart disease, uh, once I turned, as well as having it in the family, once I turned 50, I had the beautiful experience of having sudden onset hypertension. And so I don't know if anyone else in the room is on high blood pre pressure medication. Just me. Oh, yeah, no, there's a... <laughs> There's a few of us. Well, the great news, my GP said, I said, well, what does this mean for my health? And he said, I'll oh, stay on that. You've got another 50 years easy. <laughs> so I feel like my GP would be on the side of the debate saying, heart disease, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Luckily, he's not on the team tonight. Um, but there is one, um, one other issue that I was just reading um, just recently on the Heart Foundation uh, website, which said that um, one indicator of trouble, and in particular the, the risk for heart, diabetes, type 2 diabetes and heart disease, was the waist measurement. And I thought, oh, all right, I'm, you know, I might have chunked up a bit with menopause, but I'm still all right. And uh, then I had a, a little measure, and let me share something with you. Sorry, I just have to go to my bag of props.
measured it on, because we're having renovations done, we've got all of those fantastic um, measure tapes lying around. So I did measure this, and it happens to be 94 centimetres long. And if you're a bloke and your waist is bigger than that, I'm led to understand you're at a bit of risk for heart disease and, uh, and diabetes type 2 uh, in the way that they relate. Um, I can tell you right now that 80 centimetres falls round about there, and watch this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the apple shape is not kind to, to us and no matter what size you are, you can still be apple shape, you can still have a big belly and you can still be in trouble. So regardless of the outcome of tonight's debate, there's something in this for every one of us. Um, and, and you know, some of us have already learnt things like what arteries do um, <laughs> compared to veins. But it's not all about Tracy, who I have to say is fantastic. <laughs> And you would have been in great hands. And frankly, after that intro, I don't think they'll be needing to get me back at all because you're a legend, lady. Uh, now, the way it works, if you have been to one of the debates before, what I love about this is it's not just how you're swayed by the debaters. It's done in a nice um, clinical trial-ish kind of way where we take a... Well, not clinical at all, really, and hardly a trial, but uh, where we take a baseline reading of the room. So we basically find out what you think beforehand and then after hearing from our six esteemed speakers, um, what you think afterwards. Now, you have beside you or very nearby you four tickets which don't entitle you to anything except two votes. Um, so you've got two copies of each, um, an affirmative saying, it's true, we don't need to worry about heart disease anymore. So if you're feeling now is that we don't need to worry about heart disease anymore because there's been enough advances in research. We've got these great high blood pressure medications keeping us all fine. Yep. Um, I've never noticed that kind of behaviour before, but... <laughs> uh, let me just point... Yeah, OK. You know to mess with the baseline, not the eventual result. You understand how these trials work, Tom. Yeah, OK. So, um, uh, so what you're going to do right now is take one of your votes and decide... I do agree with that now before I've heard from the exper experts. My gut feeling is that I do agree there's nothing to this. We don't have to worry about heart disease anymore. If that's how you feel now before the debate, then you want to take your green, I do agree, we don't need to worry about it, and you want to pass that along and put it in... Oh, sorry, the envelopes are being passed along. Because why not mess with the system when it's working? Uh, so <laughs> um, if you put your affirmatives in the green envelopes, put your... If you don't agree, if you think, hang on a minute, I think we still have to worry about heart disease. I haven't heard anything from them yet, but my gut feeling is we do still have to worry about it. Then you want to put your red ticket in the red envelope when it comes along. Is, how's that? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Crystal? Crystal? Yeah, we've got it. OK, so you're either putting a green in the green envelope or red in the envelope, red envelope. Once that's done, we are ready to start messing with your minds big time, listening to our, to our teams of speakers. Um, let me see if I can get a bit of a feel for the room. Are these mics active at all, or...? They are. Just, you are a pro. Just turn it on, she says. Got it. Thank you. Oh, that's nicer. So um, how are we feeling? Let's get a, a bit of a temperature in the locker room before the big match. Um, so, so we're already seated. It's hard to tell what side Tom's on because he's stacked with affirmative votes there. <laughs> um, yeah, he, yeah, he's director material. Oh, hang on a minute. Yeah. Um, so in the negative camp, how are you feeling about the, room in, the mood in the room tonight? Are you getting a sense they're on side? Positive, Shana, your your team leader, your captain. We need you to really, you know, give us some some moments, some words of inspiration for you, for your loyal followers here. 
Well, I mostly feel sorry for the other team because I, I think they're going to have to go to depths to try and win this. So I'm a bit concerned about that, but we, we have actual evidence behind us, so we should... Oh. Actual evidence? Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Right, actual evidence behind you. This is getting serious. Um, is anyone actually quaking in their boots at the sound of actual evidence, or, or do we think we can cope with that at this stage? Absolutely not. We'll be fine. We're very confident. We've got an A team here against the B team. Oh, okay. You've given enough to match interview before, haven't you? Yeah, no substance. We're very confident. We've got a great team. Uh, we're, we're giving it our best on the day, and that's all we can ask. Is that Five now up at half time. Oh, let's check the votes and see how that runs. How are we going? Do we need more time for the voting process? Oh. OK, we're going to start and we will deliver the results at some stage. Now, as you know, with any debate, we go affirmative, negative, affirmative, negative. There's a lot of learning, a lot of hilarity along the way. There's a lot of temptation to interject quite rudely. Generally, we don't encourage that, but tonight I'm feeling a bit loose, yeah. So if you feel you need to interject, just get, get in there and, and have your say. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, so affirmative, negative, affirmative, negative, affirmative, negative, uh, and then we'll be voting again at the end. Now, there are some... We do abide by some very strict rules, and anyone who's been to or taken part in one of the debates before will know that... Uh, I don't have a lot of power in my life, but I have the power of the five-minute countdown, OK? So when the time comes for the end of the five minute, you will know that your time is officially up. Not only will your microphone be cut, I will probably start singing, OK? <laughs> so, and not the good stuff. Um, so we're, we're really very keen to, um, to keep to the five minutes so that it's you know, why not have one element of random fairness in this process uh, that is otherwise uh, so very much not? Um, and let's begin by uh, inviting our first uh, speaker up. Now, I want you to give a lot of love because everyone's doing it. No one's, you know, no one's getting paid. Or well, probably you are, Tom. But uh, no, one, no one else is getting paid. Oh, oh, you're getting good on you. Go, you're getting paid. All right, well, that's nice to have transparent disclosure beforehand, so, so not a political crowd. Um, OK, let's, let's hear from our first affirmative speaker. And uh, Professor James Sharman, or Jim Sharman, is a, one of the deputy directors of Menzies, as is Tracy, who we heard from earlier. Now, James leads, Jim, leads the cardiometabolic, cardiometabolic health and diseases research theme and is leader of the Blood Pressure Research Group. So maybe if you've got a machine later, we can check how things are going with the eight milligrams a day. Um, and in 2015, you received the World Hypertension League Rising Star Award in Hypertension Prevention and Control. I didn't know that was a thing, but good on, good on you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And in 2016, you became a member of the Lancet Commission on Hypertension, which that is a thing, and that's a pretty big deal. So, yeah, I, look, I don't want to make you feel a bit nervous, a bit anxious, but there's a lot of power down that end of the table at this stage. So, um, so Jim, I invite you to begin your five... Oh, and you haven't got more than three slides, have you? Because our tolerance for bad slides is minimal. <laughs> All right, good. OK, so we will be dimming the screen if you try and flick to four. Thanks, yeah. Man. OK, all right, your That's time great. begins as uh, soon as you start speaking. Thank you. Big warm welcome for James. I'll try this one. I'll try this one here. Thank you very much, Bernie. Um, undoubtedly, heart disease is, is a big issue. Uh, internationally, here in Australia, and affecting many people, including people here in this audience. And nothing that the affirmative team is going to say today is going to diminish or undermine the seriousness of heart disease. However, it is almost entirely preventable. And you can see from this slide here that in the last 30 years, there's been a 75% reduction in deaths from coronary heart disease. And that is almost entirely due just to the control of three risk factors. So smoking reduction, a reduction in high blood pressure, a reduction in high cholesterol due to medication, and improvement in medical and surgical treatments has contributed to this massive decline in death rate. 
My colleague Paul is going to talk more about the improvements in the medical and surgical treatments. But this is astounding. You don't see these sort of statistics for any other coronary any other chronic disease. The Interheart study, uh, published in the Lancet 10 years ago, now cited 10,000 times, is a landmark study. It covered 30,000 people across every inhabitable continent on the planet. And it showed us very clearly that simply these five risk factors, and we know all these, this is well known, 80% of the risk of coronary heart disease can be attributed to these five risk factors in blue, which is amazing, but even more amazing. 90%, almost the entire risk of coronary heart disease can be attributed to these nine risk factors, which we all know. And that's why the authors of, of this and other, other publications around the world show that <clears throat> prevention of coronary heart disease is based on similar principles across the planet. And that this has the potential to prevent most cases of heart disease. Most cases of heart disease, ladies and gentlemen. This, gives, this, is, this is actually incredible data. You do not see data like this. And in fact, it gives me pause to, to think about what I'm doing as leader of the cardiometabolic research group here at Menzies. How can we go on in all conscience, ethically and morally, to continue research in this field when it's all done and dusted? <laughs> It's true. So what I'm doing now tonight is announcing for the first time publicly that the cardiometabolic research theme with 40 researchers is closing down as of tonight. <laughs> this is what's happening and Trace, I probably should have mentioned to this to you earlier, but I'll send you an email later. <laughs> but I'm enthusiastic and I'm optimistic for the future because we're highly trained scientists. We've got undergraduate degrees, honours degrees, PhDs. We've got eight years of higher degrees and tertiary education. So we can retrain and we can be, become something else. We can become waiters in some of the best restaurants in town. <laughs> Perhaps not some of the best restaurants. but. <laughs> So as you can see here, I actually broke the news to some of the members of the blood pressure research group just very recently, and I'm so heartened to work with these people, so happy, enthusiastic and optimistic despite everything I've just told you. <laughs> I should mention, this was before I, the picture was taken before I told them about this news, and this is the picture after. <laughs> I, I think they, they will get there. They will get there, they're getting there. Now, um, Shauna Gall is also in the cardiometabolic research group. I broke the news to her just recently, and this was her response. As you can see, she does keep her cards very close to her chest. <laughs> we're going to hear from Shauna very shortly, and we're also going to hear from Professor Marwick. And I think what, what you should realise here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you're in the presence of an international leader in cardiology, undoubtedly. He's a rock star. In fact, he's the Mick Jagger of cardiology and he's, <laughs> he's here today and we're very lucky. But I have to say, I put it to you that he's overqualified for this debate. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. You do a Google image search of Professor Tom Marwick and this is what comes up. <laughs> do, you, do you honestly believe you're going to get a balanced opinion from this man? <laughs> Who is Mr. Heart Disease? No, I don't think so. And our final speaker here, Dr Susan Forrest from the Heart Foundation, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what's the point of the Heart Foundation after what I've told you here today? <laughs> and this is the message on the Heart Foundation website. Heart disease is the single biggest killer of Australians. That's actually not true. And our third speaker, Rosie Harrop, will write that wrong. <laughs> but the heart, heart disease can mostly be prevented, as I've told you. 90% of the risk-related coronary heart disease is preventable and we've had massive reductions in the death from coronary heart disease in Australia and worldwide, which is why I commend the motion to you, ladies and gentlemen, that heart disease, we don't have to worry about that.
And look, uh, all of the, I really feel for all of the researchers because generally when a redundancy round happens at the ABC, that's how we hear about it too. <laughs> Uh, at some comedy debate that we were never invited to. So, <laughs> um, you know, you're in great company. Uh, look, you've made some interesting points there and you've already had one um, rebuttal from Tom in the form of, that's the fourth slide. He hasn't <laughs> lost his touch. I did notice he kind of pieced a couple together there in, in a segue into what could be called five slides. Um, I guess that, you know, we'll just have to see how, how kind or cruel the team feels on the night. Now, interesting news just to hand, the result of the baseline votes. Now, this may or may not surprise you, the votes for the negative team, so this is the people who at the beginning of the night feel we do still have to worry about heart disease. That sentiment is held by 131 voters in the room. See how I said voters, not people, because I don't know how many of you grabbed multiple copies <laughs> and put them in the envelopes. Um, on the affirmative side, the people who believe uh, that, no, we're all done with it, we've got it nailed, 90% is pre preventable by decent lifestyle choice and the odd drug, uh, that's 10 people who feel... <laughs> so, I have to say, it's not what you'd call, you know, splitting the community, right? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. Look, I'm not sure if you understand how the debate works. The objective here is to change the minds of people. So that's how people feel now. We want to see how many minds are changed by the debate. So we're interested. In, what was that? Ten. Ten. <laughs> Well, let's see, shall we, Mr. 121 eventually? Uh, um, so what we're going to be doing again later, so listen carefully, see if you're swayed by the debates put to you tonight, because as well as all the entertaining value uh, presented, there are some very interesting facts. Um, I know that we've already heard some from Jim, and now Shauna, poker face Shauna, leader of the alternative team, is going to um, give the first voice for the negative team, the team that believes we do still need to worry. Let me introduce you, Shauna. Don't just stand up like that. All right, stand. Whatever works. You're, you're pretty... Yeah, OK. All right, so Dr Shauna Gall is a cardiovascular epidemiologist and senior heart research fellow here at Menzies, where she's supported by a National Heart Foundation Future Leader Fellowship, um, which does explain why she's being so extra nice to Sue, who's the, uh, the director of the... Um, <laughs> and on team, but did I say that out loud? No. Uh, no, it's all coming right from the heart. This is what you genuinely believe, your argument, Shauna. Uh, so Shauna's the chair of the Tasmanian Government's Tobacco Control Coalition, so tackling another one of the risk factors, and a member of the board of directors for the Cancer Council Tasmania. Um, Shauna came to the Menzies in 2006 after completing her PhD at the National Stroke Research Institute and the University of Melbourne. Would you join me in welcoming the star of Negative Team, first speaker, Shauna Gore. Okay, I actually thought Jim was gonna make it much harder than that, so I'm quite, uh, quite pleased with the way things are going. <laughs> that's okay. the rebuttal. <laughs> Sorry, and that's our only slide. Okay, so uh, when I heard the title of the debate, uh, this is the first thing that came to my mind. Don't worry, be happy. And then I remembered a story I'd heard about the singer of this song, his name's Bobby McFerrin, and that he died by committing suicide. But I know about statistics, and I know that if he had died, he would have died from coronary heart disease. So the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare um, collects data on this type of thing, and um, these figures here show the burden of different diseases in the population in Australia for men and for women across different age groups. So the burden includes um, death but also disability caused by diseases. So the orange boxes here show coronary heart disease and you can see that that really dominates for men across many age groups and also for women across uh, various age groups then. So this still makes the heart the single organ that is most likely to result in our death or us living with reduced quality of life. 
So back to Bobby McFerrin, he actually didn't die from heart disease and he didn't die at all. He's actually still alive, but I didn't want to let that get in the way of a good story. <laughs> so I'm just going to move on. So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a history lesson now. And I'm going to talk about the history of mankind. And I'm also going to talk about history within your own lifetime. So we often think of heart disease, as Jim has said, as a disease of modern times to do with sedentary lifestyles eating lots of processed foods and becoming overweight or obese. But would it worry you to know that heart disease has actually been around for millennia? So in some extraordinary research, um, researchers around the world gathered up mummies from ancient civilizations and put them through CT scanners. And they found that 30% of them had atherosclerosis. So this is the beginnings of heart disease where we see the thickening of the walls of arteries and the hardening of the arteries. And this is linked to an increased risk of heart attacks and other types of heart disease. So this makes me worry that we probably don't know everything we need to know about heart disease. And I really don't think we could have fixed it in just a few short decades when we look at the graphs that Jim showed going back to the 1980s. So the other part of history that I'd like you to think back to is your own childhood. And I'm sure it will worry a lot of you for me to tell you that we know that children as young as three have been shown to have the beginnings of atherosclerosis. So the very uh, start of this process where we see um, a thickening of the wall with a fatty streak in the, in the artery wall. So this worries me because it suggests that heart disease isn't just a disease of old ages, but it's really a disease of all ages. And when we consider this with trends in risk factors in children and younger people, we start to become quite worried about the future burden of heart disease. So as Jim said, heart disease is entirely preventable, perhaps not in this particular heart because he's got a few problems. <laughs> but we do know that um, there are worrying trends in, in risk factors within the current generation of young people in Australia. So I've got a few different graphs demonstrating this. So Jim's talked about the fact this is a very preventable thing. And if we all did the right thing, it wouldn't be a problem. But nobody does the right thing. Very few people do the right thing, including children. So this shows high fat food consumption, tracking children over time, with the um, orange bar showing um, the highest levels of consumption. And we can see across childhood, children actually increase their intakes of these high fat foods. This is showing physical activity levels, looking at trends across time in children, and we see that they're not improving, they're staying about the same. And we know the story of overweight and obesity, where lots of children are overweight or obese. In some places like Tasmania, it seems to still be rising, whereas in some other places, it's fairly flat. The reason why we're concerned about this is that we're starting to see some evidence that deaths from ischemic heart disease are beginning to increase, or uh, sorry, are not um, continuing to decline in younger people. So Jim showed some figures before which are similar to this, which show ischemic heart disease deaths in Australia for people in the typical ages we think about heart disease affecting people, that's in the 50s up to the 70s, and we see that downward trend in men and women that Jim showed before. But if we start to look in younger people, and this is people in their 30s and 40s up to their mid-50s, we can see that somewhere in the, um, in the period of the 1990s, this really started to level off. And we're not seeing those reductions that we were seeing earlier on or that we see in older people. So this makes me worry that we actually still have a lot of work to do. So in closing, I'd like you to remember that one in two men and one in three women will suffer from a cardiovascular disease in their lifetime. But in the words of Bobby McFerrin, don't worry, be happy, because you've got people like myself and my team fighting for you and your hearts. Thank you. Top points for timing on top of a few other issues there. I did like the sledging right at the beginning before getting on, on top of your own game there. And, now, and you did raise this question of very few people actually doing the right thing. Shauna, do you drink? <laughs> yes. you, you drink. Do you exercise where, to the point where you can't speak easily and breathe um, uh, for, I think, 20 minutes three times a week or something? I, I probably do meet that recommendation. You probably do under, what, about 30 minutes? <laughs> oh, maybe not quite. Maybe not quite. When did you give up smoking? Yeah, my pack-a-day habit's the real problem, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So the, the research might be there. The work still might have a bit of a way to go with the implementation of the prevention side of things. But look, let's move on to our second affirmative because I think we could lift again a bit, lift the mood after. Uh, yeah, I love that we start with a joke about suicide. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can see why you didn't go for the bedside medical career and went to epidemiology. Uh, good call. Um, someone who does deal a lot with patients, so is bound to have a much warmer touch, is um, Dr. Paul McIntyre. Now, Paul is the director of cardiology at the Royal Hobart, and uh, he's, you know, clinical interests in general cardiology, pacemakers, and cardiac rehab. He's a graduate of. Glasgow University, and in 2005, he was appointed lead clinician for coronary heart disease in Scotland, which, as we all know, is the home of the deep fried Mars bar. So, <laughs> he's on top of the game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's also a convener of the Cardiology Clinical Advisory Group to the Health Minister and a member of the Tasmanian Health Council. So, he knoweth of what he speaketh. Um, interesting that. So, First of all, we've got the head of the, um, the blood pressure research group uh, arguing that we don't need to do more research in this. Now we've got a cardiologist saying we've already solved heart pro. I think someone wants to play a bit more golf is what <laughs> some message I'm getting there. But look, let's hear it from you. Give a warm welcome to Dr. Paul McIntyre. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Shona, for the cartoons and that evangelical approach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, look what we've done in the treatment of heart disease since 1950. Look at these interventions, these paradigms that have changed the course of death from coronary heart disease. If you follow this line, then it gets to zero in 2021. We've <laughs> abolished coronary heart disease. It's absolutely amazing. But is that a good thing? It's not necessarily a good thing. Ideally, we all want to live a long and healthy life and succumb suddenly to a sudden cardiac, painless death. The alternative, you'll hear from my colleague later, is to die of a painful, long, slow death from cancer. <laughs> After recurrent surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy and palliative care. Is that what you want? So we need to disinvest in cardiovascular disease, otherwise we're going to abolish it. <laughs> Look at these advances in technology. Does the mouse work? There it is. This is a, an echocardiogram. Professor Marwick is, is old enough to remember when we only had M-mode echocardiography. He has pioneered advances in echocardiography. Look at that image. It's as clear and crisp as you can get. It's beautiful. On to CT coronary angiography, you can see a stenosis of the left anterior descending artery, non-invasively with a CT scan. Absolutely amazing. This is a Sestamibe scan that shows myocardial perfusion, blood flow through the heart, this is a cardiac CT scan combined with, uh, with a PET scan, so-called fusion. It's so good you can eat it. <laughs> On to cardiac MRI. Now look at the definition in this picture of the heart. You can make very precise, accurate measurements of all sorts of dimensions within the heart with a cardiac MRI scan. And recently I saw at the Cardiac Society this technique Cardiac MR 4D flow, showing blood flow. That should be a moving picture, showing blood flowing through the heart up into the aorta. <coughs> the aorta. <laughs> um, amazing. Absolute amazing technology. What advanced we've made. We don't need to do any more. We can see everything with these images. We can see if your heart is broken. <laughs> and we can fix it. <laughs> Disinvest. Heart disease, we don't need to worry about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Now, you may have noticed that I have a Scottish accent. And that goes down very well with women <laughs> over the age of 75. <laughs> they see me as a Sean Connery type toy boy. <laughs> um, but I am now an Australian citizen. And I am entitled. And I'm entitled to tell you about a scourge in our society, in Australia and particularly in Tasmania. And it's called vested interest. <laughs> it's about people protecting their own patch, about preventing change, in fact, obstructing change. And this is a picture of Tom Marwick as Xerxes, a living god, the ruler of the ancient Persian Empire. But Tom's not a living god, it's a vested interest. <laughs> of course he wants to protect his position he loves research he travels all around the world on planes talking what a life that is with a decent salary <laughs> it helps his self esteem his self efficacy all these touchy feely things for the psychologists in the audience and it makes him feel better about himself and it's the same for Dr Shona Gall Albeit on a much smaller stage. <laughs> and as for the Australian Heart Foundation, now I am qualified to talk about the Australian Heart Foundation because I'm on the board. <laughs> and my chair is in the audience. They are also interested in vested interest. We need to stop investing and give our money to a more deserving charity. We need to be honest with ourselves, <laughs> discard vested interest and invest in the greater good and embrace change. <laughs> Yep, thanks. <laughs> can't turn the phone off, can't turn the mic on. <laughs> no wonder they get me here. Uh, <laughs> Professor Tom Marwick needs hardly any introduction, and in fact, I think he just had it. <laughs> he used to be here, he's not anymore. He's come back for tonight. Give him a warm welcome. Well, thanks, Bernie. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be back here. Some of you will remember Saddam Hussein and the weapons of mass destruction. Well, what you heard from our opposition there were weapons of some description. I think <laughs> mass seduction could be possibly described. You heard one of them who's a researcher saying he's not going to research the problem anymore. You heard a cardiologist say that the problem had been solved but unfortunately, there were a lot of untruths there as well. You heard that if you died from cancer, it was going to be a slow, painful death. But if I can go back and take the liberty of showing you this <laughs> slide here, which I won't count because it's not one of mine. <laughs> what are all these things? They're procedures, God bless us. These cardiac patients have procedures coming out of their ears. So, unfortunately, having a cardiac problem does not mean you're going to succumb rapidly. 
So I... It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. It takes a worried man to sing a worried song. I'm worried now, but I won't be worried long. Okay, it does take a worried man to sing a worried song, and I am a worried man. I'll show you why. You've seen this curve from multiple speakers, the reduction of cardiovascular deaths over the last few decades. What they didn't show you was in 2011 in America, that was the first year that that number plateaued. And now that number is going to go, start going back the other way. As my colleague, Shauna Gall, told you, in younger generations, we are seeing the, that these individuals are getting cardiovascular disease at an earlier stage than their parents. What an embarrassment. And a result of the complacency that our colleagues on the opposite team are trying to encourage. Now, this is still a very major problem. One life lost every 12 minutes. And whether we argue successfully that cancer's the number one and we're the number two, oh my heavens, if only we were the number two, you know? I mean, that would, it's so embarrassing being number one and people succumbing from this problem. But in fact, when it comes to cost, there's no question that cardiovascular disease is the most expensive disease in our community. It's a huge drain on our economy. Now the question is, why would we want to worry? Well, maybe worry will motivate change and prevention. And you heard from the first speaker how this is a preventable disease. But here's the problem. We know what causes the disease, but of those individuals that have high blood pressure, between a third and a half of them don't even know that they've got it. Our medical system doesn't seem to be able to screen them adequately. And when they are identified, a third of them are not treated to target blood pressure. High cholesterol. Half of the people who have high cholesterol are not treated to target. Diabetes. More than half of the individuals who have diabetes do not have adequate sugar control. Tobacco use. Tasmania is leading Australia in the number of people, particularly young people, who smoke. And finally, the unhealthy diet and obesity, still a, a growing problem for us, and I pardon the pun. Physical inactivity, more than half of Australians do not satisfy the current guidelines. So, yes, we should be anxious because possibly only by being anxious and aware of this problem can you expect people to make the interventions that my former colleague, Professor Sharman, presented for the opposition in the first slide. Now, I notice that there's a couple of people in the audience over the age of 65, or who may be over the age of 65, and in the closing moments, I would like to tell you about two epidemics that are burgeoning in older Australians, and they are heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Both of them are still growing unchecked. Both of them have very sinister consequences in terms of both costs, a billion dollars each or more, readmission rates to hospital, a burden on our medical system, a mortality that is similar to cancer, and unfortunately, these individuals do not just die of their disease, they're sick for a decade before they die. So what Rosie is going to tell you from the opposition as the last speaker that cancer is a miserable death, well, I can tell you, if you have heart failure or atrial fibrillation, this is not a pleasant thing. So why worry? These are preventable illnesses. I'm a worried man for good reason. Stop me worrying. work that thing. <laughs> yeah, I can see. Yeah, mm, mm. Uh, well done, Tom. You're a bit focused on the money, aren't you? Yeah. Just, there wasn't a lot about people and humanity in there. There was a lot of dollars. There was, oh no, there were, there were tables and there were bullet points. Yeah, don't get me wrong. There were that. Uh, I like that you didn't pick up on, well, neither of us picked up on. I like that extension of the graph to 2021 and zero, which was... Uh, not only an appalling visual 
Uh, bit of, you know, that was never going to... It was going to go to 2023, like, at least. Um, but, you know, stats, stats, stats. Uh, OK. Um, I feel like we've heard equal arguments, equal numbers of arguments from both sides now. I'm not sure about the quality, but we've heard equal numbers of arguments from both sides now, and I reckon it's down to our last two players, one from each team, to do the job of swaying us, if they can, away from our original opinion. Now, our next speaker is Clinical Associate Professor Rosemary Harrop, who's trained in medical oncology and clinical haematology and completed, oh, she completed a dual fellowship in those in 2001, when she was just 13, by the looks of it. <laughs> um, she's head of the Department of Medical Oncology and Haematology at the Royal Hobart, and she's a member of the board of the Cancer Council of Tasmania, the Tasmanian Cancer Registry Advisory Group, and the Royal Hobart Hospital Research Foundation Scientific and Advisory Committee. Um, I've got a feeling I know where you're going with this when you're arguing that heart disease is not the real problem. Do you want a hat to pass around and gather funds? No. All right. <laughs> Would you please join me in welcoming Rosemary Harris, our final affirmative speaker. Thank you. So, I would just like to make it clear, the problem is not heart disease. It might have been in the past, but it's not the current problem, and we just all have to move on. So, as you can see with this graph here, uh, as I didn't bring my glasses, I can't actually see it. Um, <laughs> the incidence of cancer in Australia has been increasing by about 3% per year year on year since figures were starting to be collated. In Tasmania, that figure is actually about 3.8% per year and has been as high as 4.2% per year in the last little while by virtue of our ageing population. So what does this mean for us? It means that 72,000 men and 62,000 women will be diagnosed with cancer in Australia in 2017. Uh, it also means that over 47,000 people will die from cancer in Australia. Now, anyone who's good on figures, got an epidemiologist statistic, <laughs> we had a figure from Tom there that was one death every 12 minutes. Well, I have to say, we're winning that race. I had it as 160 a day. And then we've got our Health Indicators Tasmania 2013. Now, this tells us that cancer deaths were almost twice as common in Tasmania in 2013 than ischemic heart disease deaths. This is something that was actually published by the, the Department of Health. Oh, oh well. And um, <laughs> was actually had great input from, from many of the statisticians and epidemiologists in this room. I stand by, by our, our, uh, our argument that really this is our problem that we have to worry about now. Oops, that's another problem we have to worry about. <laughs> right. So, what are we going to do about this, this disease? So, it affects one in two men and one in three women who m make it to 80 years of age. There, are, there was 1.1 million cancer-related hospitalisations in the year 2014-15 financial year. And that's about 10% of our hospitalisations. The cost of that, the burden, is enormous. In 2011, cancer was the leading cause of death, disease burden, and that accounted for about 20% uh, of the disease burden, and most of that was due to dying prematurely. How do we work that figure out? Well, we assume that, most, that the average age that people will make is 84 for females and 82 for men, and hence we can calculate the years lost uh, early, uh, prematurely to cancer. So what does that really mean in real terms? What's the most common cause of cancer and death in childhood? It's brain tumour. It's a third of the cancer deaths in childhood. 
Is that a disease we're making great steps in, progress? Not at all. I've just done the figures for Australia for a five-year cohort. Our outcome for brain tumour in, in the 15 to 25-year-old population age group is the same in the last six years as it was 30 years ago. Five-year survival rate, 70%. Lower than the US, lower than the UK. Can we do better? And who have we got looking after this enormous burden of disease? Well, we know that the collective noun for oncologist is metastasis, but what's the, <laughs> the collective noun for haematologist is a blood clot. What's, what's the collective noun for cardiologist? Clark? <laughs> I don't know. However, I do know that we have half the number of oncologists and none of us have got time to play golf. <laughs> and what else have we got to worry about? Well, we need to look at where we're putting our funds for research if we're going to be able to overcome this problem, this major worry. So recently, um, the Vice President um, Biden in the, in the US announced that there would be another moonshot at curing cancer. And so the NCI would be granted the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institute of Health over there that has the, the funding body for a lot of cancer research. One point, mm, I'm going to run out of time here. Right, anyway, they haven't got enough money. So what are the, <laughs> what are the solutions? Well, we've already heard this lovely, delightful young woman. <laughs> she, she's got all the skills. We can retrain her. <laughs> okay. We've got Sue with her fantastic corporate skills. All we need to do is get her to reapply to the right institute. The Cancer Council of Tasmania would be more than happy to look at your CV. And then we've got our living God. <laughs> well, what we, can we say is that now that your worries are over, Tom, it is time. <laughs> oh, nice work, nice work. That's team playmanship or whatever the collective noun for that is. <laughs> Great work all round. Well, that's it for the affirmative team. We have now got the linchpin for the negative team, our third speaker for the, ne for the negative team, um, who is well qualified, as it turns out, for many jobs um, <laughs> uh, across the board, but is currently occupying the position of Director of Cardiovascular Health Programs at the Heart Foundation in Victoria. She's a former CEO of the Australian Genome Research Facility and now leads the Heart Foundation team translating national strategic goals into programs and policy in the areas of heart care and healthy living. Join us for the final chance at swaying for even more votes for the negative result Doc, in, in welcoming Dr Sue Forrest. Woo! Thank you and esteemed colleagues. Um, there are a couple of points I'd just like to round up and um, uh, debunk early on in the piece. Uh, first of all, Jim, uh, heart disease can be prevented. Can's a very big little word. <laughs> it really is. And I think what we're really seeing is although 80 to 90 per cent can be prevented, it's not actually what we see in real life. Who starts New Year with a goal to do, to lose weight or to exercise? Hands up. And who's still doing that in, say, February? <laughs> so that's the difference between can be prevented and preventable. <laughs> Quite different. So that doesn't mean heart disease is actually resolved. Paul, who taught you how to do graphs? <laughs> really and truly, extrapolation and nonsense about things that are continuing to trend downwards, whereas my eloquent colleagues have clearly shown you that environmental impacts and all of these risk factors and what's happening to children 
let alone some of the commercial companies around like Maccas and some of our friendly places, not helping our dietary and exercise requirements. So that graph ain't on the way down, that's for sure. And Rosemary, this is the talk on heart disease. Did you, did you not get the notes? <laughs> it's not on cancer. And versus, what a bad word in public health. Why would you want cancer to verse heart disease? It's that great verb that all the children use. <laughs> They're, it's all important. It all needs attention. So we just forget the whole spiel about cancer. I could also tell you with your colours that we have decided to all wear red underwear, but the three of us have decided that we're not actually going to show you that tonight. <laughs> so, so just very briefly, continuing on the worrying theme, this is the heart disease facts. Park cancer. This is what actually happens. An hour every day an Australian dies from a heart attack and the costs to the country are significant. That $2 billion is a massive figure and it's about 12 per cent of our health budget. And there are constantly more and more prescriptions being written. There, you've heard about high blood pressure. These are all issues. But the little box on the bottom about the 50 per cent, those that actually do survive a heart attack don't return to the same level of work and don't return necessarily to the same amount of physical activity. There are long-term consequences of heart disease. So people are now living longer. Rather than looking at the rate of deaths from heart attack or heart disease, it's the longevity of the heart disease that we're trying to deal with. And there are more than 630,000 Australians living with heart disease, and living being the operative word. How do we help people live well and live properly with heart disease? If you do have children or grandchildren and you've got heart disease, you really still want to be able to play and entertain them properly. And heart disease actually is the greatest risk in the developing world. We've got serious inequity even within Australia. Our Aboriginal um, friends and colleagues have a much higher rate of heart disease and heart incidence compared to um, non-Indigenous Australians. And the death rate for Aboriginal and Indigenous populations from heart disease was at least 90, it was 70 per cent higher than the general population. So from the heart of Australia, I think there's a new way of looking at Tasmania, where you really are the heart of Australia. But there are still a number of things here that we need to be addressing. 3,200 Tasmanians living with heart failure, all these adults with hypertension. We really appeal to you as a community to work together to help all these people that have had heart disease that are still needing support to actually go for that walk, to change their diets, to address their cholesterol issues. This is essential for Tasmania. But we've had a very Australian-focused conversation. So even if you see some improvements in Australia, there's a big wide world out there. And certainly from the rest of the world, the incidence of heart disease, and if we take China as one of those major, major populations, as well you know, um, the incidence of heart disease in China and heart-related events is up 50 per cent. So the population and the breadth of challenge in more developing countries um, and in large population countries is significant. It isn't going away and we have to do better to manage heart disease. It is still something we need to worry about. Thank you. Did you see how Sue took us on a journey there? She, she made us care, she made us laugh, she roused on us a little bit as well. And, and I think just putting all of those different emotions in the bag really, really captured something. But was it enough to capture a vote? Was it enough to change the ratio of, of feeling from 10 versus 131 to... <laughs> say 11 or 9. That's all it takes. One changed mind overall. There's maths involved, so we'll, we'll have to get a, a fine bit of look-see on that again. Now, what we're doing, um, if you can, having taken all of that in, and really, right now, regardless of what you're doing, give it up 
for all of our panellists. Mighty, 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 mighty. They've done a fantastic job tonight, regardless of what the job description was. Not entirely sure any of us are clear on that. Uh, fantastic job. I know we've all learnt something, regardless of what we came in here believing. While the votes are being collected and passed around, we are now going to give you a chance to ask some questions that may have been prompted by something that's been said tonight. So if I could ask our spectacular and give them another round of applause to encourage them, come and take their seats. And uh, we're going to have, whoops. Is it? I think it is now. Now it's on. Now it's on. Thank you. I knew I'd be in strife if it wasn't. Uh, okay. So now we've got, oh, I see a question over there. Get your hands up. We've only got about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. So we'll go there, there. Yep. Uh, yes, please. How is it that you can be fit, eating healthy food, have low blood pressure, but still have that high risk of cholesterol? Who wants to tackle the cholesterol risk? Who's that? Thank you. Tom. Uh, microphone. You're absolutely right. It is possible for that to happen. Uh, in truth, it is a minority problem. M most of heart disease is, is, uh, occurs in individuals who, who actually aren't intervening on their risk factors. But the, the driver of the problem with cholesterol is genetics. So. It relates to how particular enzymes in the liver change saturated fat into cholesterol and you inherit the likelihood of, of not or doing that too much or the imbalance of that from your parents. So there's a genetic component to this. As well. Anything you can do if it's genetic? There is. Uh, people that have a genetic problem are just as able to respond to medical therapy as people who don't have a genetic problem. Uh, yeah, except for the side effects. Yep. Yes, so um, the, the thing that's encouraging there is that there's a new generation of drugs coming out that are not statin-related, completely different molecule, um, that, that don't have the statin side effects. Great. And we have a question here. I've heard uh, that uh, heart disease medication can cause diabetes. Is that correct? Heart disease medication can cause diabetes. The Lancet man is nodding. Or, uh, no? But... Dressed like a cricketer. I don't want to jeopardise the vote by... Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. The votes are in their sachets as we speak. Well, di diuretics can certainly um, influence diabetes. Um, if you can speak a little bit more into the mic, Paul. Not particularly. There's, there's not... No, uh... Paul, what I mean by that is hold the mic a bit closer Sorry. to your mouth. Right. That's it. You got it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you hear in that respect? Uh, my sister's doctor told me. Was it diabetics oh, or diuretics? To, to, become to become diabetic increases, not diuretics. Okay. The, the, there, there is an association between long term statin use and the development of diabetes. Um, it's a very rare association. And um, I think that people who are taking statins to control their cholesterol, um, you know, the, the dominant effect is positive. So it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't inhibit me from taking statins. Great. And we have a question up the back. Somewhere? Oh. Oh, I thought, <laughs> sorry, I thought you were, you were collecting envelopes. Got you now. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes? What about diagnoses that don't... Um have any of the problems like, for instance, high blood pressure or diabetes or obesity, things like cardiomyopathy. How are you addressing the research and the study in that department? Cardiomyopathy, is anyone across here? Yeah. So it, that's a really good question and it's important that the that the title of this was about cardiac disease or cardiovascular disease, not just about coronary disease or ischemic heart disease. So what we were talking about, about the blockage of the vessels is not the only problem. And cardiomyopathy is a heart muscle disease. 
And there are treatments for that that decrease the mortality associated with it, but it's still an area where work research still needs to be done. And Jim, if you're thinking about retraining, cardiomyopathy definitely is the place to be. <laughs> Terrific. We've got a question right up the back. Thank you. A two-part question. The first okay, one... Steady on, big fella. Oh. We'll have one part and then we'll see. Um, the the stat, statin issue had some bad press uh, last year, year before. Uh, is it, how much is the uh, reduction in inflammation uh, important in, in, in the whole scenario? It's not just cholesterol. Uh, so that's the first part. Hang so, on, I'm gonna, what, what, let's get an answer on that then. So can we just, because maybe not everyone here is completely familiar with statins and, and the role that they play and, um, and inflammation and the role it plays. So if we could give a nice lectorial response, who would like to? Let me guess. Well, I, <laughs> no, I, I wanted to. You I asked Paul. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a very important question. So statins decrease cholesterol by affecting this en enzyme HMG-CoA reductase in the liver, which is the enzyme that produces cholesterol. So it's not the cholesterol we eat that's the problem, it's the cholesterol we make in our livers. So statin in statins inhibit that en enzyme and decrease cholesterol. But in addition to that, statins have got anti-inflammatory effects. So if you have plaques in your arteries, the likelihood of them rupturing is less if you're on a statin than not. And inflammation is a very important part of this process. So there was a trial that was just announced uh, probably about three, four weeks ago about a very potent anti-inflammatory that is ridiculously expensive, not suitable for clinical use, but proves the concept that if you control inflammation, then you can make a major impact into this problem. So really super question and two effects of statins that are quite different. Okay, before you, we get Professor. to part B, before we get to part B, did everyone vote? Because the numbers aren't tallying. Oh, here's, sorry, does anyone still have a vote to, oh, we've got a couple to collect. Is it this whole row? No, we collected Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. And there's, oh, the young lady down the front. <laughs> um, so if anyone who's still got a vote and hasn't given the, yeah, 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 nice try. <laughs> Yeah, but how many? Multiple times? Get it away. Get away from them. They're shocking. Honestly. Try anything twice. Um, okay, so we've, we're just collecting those last few votes. Does anyone else still have a, an uncounted vote? Remember, vote yes for human rights. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, now, sir, back to you for part two. Oh, thank you. It was just in relation to the 50% increase in events in China. It uh, doesn't have a time frame there, I don't think, but is that to do with the shift from the agricultural economy to the industrialisation and people moving to cities and eating Western diets? Yeah, so the 50% um, the projection is based on the number of events based on the population growth and ageing, and then there's an additional 23% increase in events based on risk factors, which was balancing out um, some decreases in smoking but still very high and some other things like obesity and physical activity. So a, a huge increase coming for places like um, China, India less so, um, but yeah, China's really where the, where the problem's going to start happening soon. Oh, we have another question there, but I also have a question and it's your second question, so I feel like I can jump in. Um, the kids, do we have any idea what's causing the atherosclerosis? Is it just because we've only just started looking in kids or has it always been there? Some of that data is very old, it comes from quite a long time ago. Decade. Like the mummies? Yeah, that's right, mummies. that's a really long time ago. Yeah. Um, so some of it is probably genetic related, as, as Tom was saying, so people with cholesterol problems that are genetic and they're getting that build up there. But yeah, certainly other risk factors um, likely play a role. Um, but yeah, it, it's one of those really surprising things that you hear about and So we don't know possible. if it's, it's not just that it's just starting to be looked at so we're seeing it because we didn't look at it before, it's right. Yeah, it yeah, so I mean we, you know, here at the Menzies we do studies where we're following children into adulthood trying to understand how these things happen and, and the same types of risk factors that we see as being involved in adults are involved in younger people developing yeah. them. Um, so yeah, it's still the same risk factors I think. Okay, yep. Because of obesity, we're seeing an epidemic of type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. in younger and younger people. And at autopsy, if, you know, after a road traffic accident, for example, you're seeing a thromatous plaque in, in teenagers, you know, mm. and it's probably related 
uh, to obesity and type 2 diabetes. So are they matching? In a younger population. And that, that's, I'm talking against one team here, but that's the, <laughs> the, the, votes are in, you're that's safe, the epidemic of the future driven by diabetes. Yeah. There's something that you're forgetting about heart disease, which, which I think you touched on, and, and that's about inequity. I mean, we studied this in Scotland and, and saw that patients who come from lower socioeconomic groups have got a massive increase mm. in coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease in general. And that's driven by social circumstances, by adverse life circumstances. These people live in, in very difficult circumstances and the last thing they think about is going for a job or stopping smoking because that's, you know, they're living mm. from day to day in chaotic lifestyles. Uh, that drives adverse lifestyles, cardiovascular risk, uh, cardiovascular disease and then cardiovascular events. So it's a continuum. But if you, you trace it back to that, to the, the, the life circumstances yeah. in people who are disadvantaged and live in lower socioeconomic groups. Because I was interested, because that was the tenth factor that wasn't that was in the slides, but wasn't one of the nine contributing to ninety percent reduction or well, maybe I just oversimplified ridiculously the maths there. <laughs> Right, but um, but what you're saying is is it that the um, the socioeconomic life that you've got, the cards you're dealt in terms of impoverishment, is that s separate from all the other factors? Um, so it it's not just that it's a driver to those other factors. If you're impoverished and don't do any of the other things, it's, it's a driver because it, it determines how they behave in terms of lifestyle. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's both. But there's another factor. There's a very good piece of research coming out of Glasgow um, on why some people emerge from these lower socioeconomic areas and actually do quite well you know, around wellness and, and what within the family catapults an individual to succeed in life mm. as opposed to stay behind in the same housing estate and have the same life circumstances as their parents. Um, and it's led by a guy called Harry Burns, who was my senior colleague at the Scottish Government. Uh, he was the CMO. And it's very interesting stuff that's come out. And he's also identified a Glasgow factor, something about Glasgow, probably the weather, mm. that, uh, that makes people do worse. Mm. Yeah. So there's more to it than that. Yeah. And, and when you look at... We, we deal with patients all the time. Uh, when, they, when they come in from disadvantaged backgrounds, it's, it's really difficult to get them to have any health behaviour change. Interestingly, when they have a cardiovascular event, a heart attack or a stroke, they're much more willing to make lifestyle changes because they're supported through that process. Mm. Man, the hat is adding a slight Connery factor <laughs> there some, somehow. I don't know, I kind of glazed over during half of what you were saying, but it was still interesting because of the hat and the accent. No, <laughs> not at all. We did have it. OK, we are... Oh, my Lord. I did not predict that. Did anyone else predict that? No one knows. <laughs> OK, um, I have to say that... Uh, I'll just remind you of the original votes. Um, before we heard from our esteemed debaters tonight, there were 10 people agreeing that we don't need to worry about heart disease anymore, it's all sorted. 131 people very staunchly, I just added that, they just <laughs> voted actually, uh, very staunchly voted that, uh, that we do still need to worry about heart disease after hearing the arguments put forward by a very esteemed panel of debaters, there have been a number of minds changed and that number, when you know, just do a quick tally, is 28. So now we have, and there could have been more, but they, some have corrected by switching sides. Uh, so um, we now have 38 people agreeing that we don't need to worry about... You know... It really speaks to the January resolve to give up the bad lifestyle in February. And it's like, oh no, they're right. Yeah, okay, it's not that big of a deal, really. Honestly, you people, you'll believe anything. Anything with a bit of a costume and a bit of a shake of the can, 
asking for money. Oh yeah, they said cancer. I'll vote for them. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Obviously, it was another well put argument with another unexpected result. A true upset in the ladder of expectations in the continuing series of Menzies research debates. Put it together again for the unsuspecting winners, the affirmative team, and the very gracious. Not so winnery team tonight. I think it depends how you define the winning side, doesn't it? The <laughs> outcome. Well, they have won themselves out of jobs. Uh, yeah. Oh, what was the big number there? The big. Oh, we're not all about big numbers. We're about, we're about change. We're affecting change. Change in behaviour. Yeah, yeah. It's the hard thing. <laughs> oh, if you're going to go all old school, sure. You won before you started, but then you started losing by the end. So, yeah, I'm not sure which way you want to go with that. Um, thanks again very much. You've been terrific, but I want to hand over to uh, Tracy Dixon who's also been terrific and uh, do you need a microphone Tracy or you're good okay thank you very much so I'm going to learn from the beginning of the debate I'm not going to even try and say something clever about the heart but <laughs> I was a green voter <laughs> and it is about the brain there so <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, Bernie, and thanks to all our speakers. We have for all of you a, a little hamper here of Heart Smart Foods. Tom, we've snuck a donut into yours. <laughs> and um, I really want to thank everyone, of course, for participating in tonight's debate. I think you'll agree it's been a, a fantastic evening. So just finally, um, our director here, Professor Alison Venn and her mother Mary, were really looking forward to this evening's de debate. Sadly, heart disease crept up on Mary and led to her death unexpectedly late last week. She would have really appreciated the humour and the importance of this subject. And Alison is grateful for the opportunity to pay tribute to her mother here tonight. And for the record, Alison would like to let you all know that she and her mum would have voted for the negative. So thank you, everyone. Good night, and thanks for being here at Menzies. Bernie, Bernie has prompted me because, of course, Miranda doesn't write a thank you to herself on, on my help notes. But, of course, I really would like to appreciate and thank Miranda and her team for all of the efforts that she puts into tonight, but all of the events that we host here at Menzies. They're really an important part of the outreach that we do, the important connection that we have with our community, and they don't just happen overnight. So thank you, Miranda, for all of your hard work and for everyone here. And because I can't bear not having the last word, um, I also want to thank Miranda, who, with all that was going on today, was absolutely spectacular. The whole team is great. Year in, year out, the panellists are, without fail, spectacular. You never know what you're going to get. They never disappoint. Um, and also, I just want to remind you, the calibre of events that you do here is absolutely top shelf. So it's really um, this kind of event, any institution in Australia would be proud to have a turnout like this and a fantastic panel, engaging, hilarious, learning, all of that. So it's one of the highlights of my year. So you were great, but please have me back, okay? <laughs>